Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Technology Horizons event. We have a great afternoon set up for all of you all to uh, help strengthen public-private collaboration on nationally important technologies. Agenda-wise, you can see we're going to kind of start here. Got a good uh, keynote panel for you all for the first hour, and they're going to separate into two different tracks. In this room will be, first off, artificial intelligence, and then we'll follow that with the future telecommunications. And then the room upstairs is going to be biotechnology and microelectronics. So we'll go over this in a little bit more detail going forward. So with that said, let's kind of jump right into it. Uh, so the United States stands at the convergence of multiple inflection points within science technology advancement. Uh, first off, we're in the very beginning stages of having a handful of technologies fundamentally change what is possible and thus significantly influence our national security and economic prosperity for the next few decades. Uh, secondly, new federal programs with significant financial resources are being established to increase the government's investment in translational or use-inspired research while also maintaining its historical focus on basic research. And finally, there's a growing understanding that the United States must operate in a different, more collaborative manner on critical topics than we have in the past if we're to be successful within the modern international science and technology competition. So this convergence of those three trends drives our event today and is also a big focus for our keynote panelists who I'll invite to the stage to uh, join me as we go first. Uh, first off, uh, Dr. P.J. Makish serves as the senior advisor at the Special Competitive Studies Project whose mission is to make recommendations to strengthen America's long-term competitiveness as emerging technologies are reshaping our national security, economy, and society. Uh, they want to ensure that America is positioned and organized to win the techno-economic competition between now and 2030, the critical window for shaping the future. Prior to joining SCSP, PJ was the Director for Technology Competition at the National Security Council. Tessa Blank Knowles is a staff associate for technology policy and strategy in the National Science Foundation's new Director for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, or TIPS, uh, whose mission is to advance U.S. competitiveness through investments that accelerate the development of key technologies and address pressing societal and economic challenges. Prior to joining NSF, kind of, this gets a little flaky, how the government works, uh, but Tess, uh, until a month, about a month or so ago, was a senior policy advisor in the National AI Initiative Office in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And family, finally, Dan Woolley is MITRE's entrepreneur in residence. MITRE itself is a nonprofit corporation that serves the public interest by operating six federally funded research and development centers, or FFRDCs. He guides federal executives on public private partnerships that engage researchers, academics, nonprofits, and the private industry to use creative, data driven, and interdisciplinary approaches as they improve mission delivery and services to citizens. Prior to joining MITRE, he spent more than 40 years building successful global teams, led international cybersecurity organizations, and has been an active early stage investor in cybersecurity, smart cities, AI, and digital healthcare startups. Please join me in welcoming PJ, Tess, and Dan. All right, so we're first here from our panelists on what they're working on. Uh, and kind of provide their overall perspectives on what's, what's taking place now. I'll ask a couple of questions as follow-up. But then we're going to invite you all as the audience to ask your questions. You'll see that there we have microphones at the front of these tables. So when the time comes, just kind of line up here beside uh, Melanie and Tara so they can uh, help me bash you in the head if you're off topic. How about that? Very good. All right, so PJ, how about we start with you? Uh, so please explain to us uh, what's happening in science and, uh, science and technology globally and how SESP is trying to help America succeed. Yeah, thank you so much, Dwayne. First of all, thank you for the invitation and thanks to MITRE. What is this? Um, the Special Competitive Studies Project is a 501c3 foundation that grew out of the National Commission on Artificial Intelligence, where I had the privilege of serving with TESS. Um, the AI Commission made recommendations to strengthen American competitiveness in AI. China had a plan that had moved out called the AI Plan since 2017. It was uh, well invested from everything we could tell on the classified and unclassified sides. So the AI Commission came along, started to think, how do you pull the nation together to come up with a strategy to start to continue leading in AI. Um, and our, our project grew out of that. It's a three-year project funded by Eric Schmidt, who was the chair, former CEO of Google. And we're organized to continue to make recommendations about America's competitiveness, um, a, very, a shared vision, for instance, at NSF TIF. The way we do that is by having panels that convene the nation across the four traditional instruments of power. So we have one for diplomacy, intel, military, and econ. Now we have two panels for cross-cutting tech issues in society and one for tech leadership. That's the Future Tech Platforms panel, which I'm most associated with. 
So we're trying to, in essence, create a public-private model to do tech strategy for the nation on things we regard as battleground issues. These are topics that would be shared with OSTPs, 19 technologies that they came from, a process I was able to participate in. And then they also jive with DOD's list of 14 technologies. But we've chosen six based on 21 questions we ask uh, about national competitiveness, which we can get into. It's interesting. But that's where I come from at SESB and what we're trying to do to move the ball forward to the country. Great. Thanks so much, BJ. Uh, Tess, uh, so Tip is NSF's first new director in, I think, over 30 years. Uh, so could you kind of explain to us what the heck it is and how it aligns with what PJ just shared? Yeah, thank you. So I think reacting to, uh, great, thanks, um, the exact same scenario that, that PJ was talking about, Congress recognized that, you know, there's a need to advance U.S. competitiveness in key technology areas. And in the Chips and Science legislation of 2022, authorized the establishment of the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate at NSF. And that often kind of gets lost in the conversation around chips and science. There is this and science component to the legislation that is actually this very big investment in the way that we do science and research funding and doing so through that lens of competitiveness. So how are we translating that research into use, into commercial uh, applications and into government applications? Um, and let me just pause here because I'm not sure if everyone is always familiar with the National Science Foundation is. So the National Science Foundation was established in 1950 with the mandate to advance uh, the progress of science and advance national health, prosperity and welfare and secure the national defense. Um, we primarily do this through grant funding, uh, primarily to academia, but not only to academia. Um, and so uh, TIP got was given the mandate in the Chips and Science le legislation to advance research and development, technology development, and related solutions to address US societal, national, and geostrategic challenges um, in the national interest. Um, and in that legislation, we were given 10 critical technology areas, not 16 or six. Um, and unsurprisingly, the technologies that we're talking about today, um, uh, AI, biotech, advanced communications, um, and microelectronics were all on that list. Um, and then uh, we were tasked as uh, the directorate to advance U.S. competitiveness in these 10 technology areas while also addressing five societal, national, and geostrategic challenges. And those are national security, workforce uh, uh, development and uh, skills development, uh, manufacturing and uh, productivity, um, inequitable access to education uh, and opportunities, um, and climate change uh, and environmental sustainability. So that's quite a hefty mandate. Um, what we're doing is kind of around three main thrusts. I'm just gonna kind of outline them and we can dive deeper um, in the conversation. And so we're really trying to foster innovation um, and technology ecosystems around the nation. Um, and this is through the explicit goal of how can we create more opportunities for Americans kind of everywhere across America. Um, and one of our flagship programs that was launched to do this is called the Regional Innovation Engines Program. And it's all about investing in regions who have maybe not yet benefited from the, the benefits of emerging technology and the technology boom, um, and really um, building um, ecosystems around a specific technology or a specific challenge area. Um, uh, they will be funded, the, each of these engines, uh, at $160 million over 10 years. And it really, um, there's partnerships at the core of this. So um, in order to pr propose to the program, um, regions have to bring together partnerships of academics, local government, private sector partners, and it's about advancing a technology, applying it to a challenge, and then building that infrastructure in the region to then support the, the development of this ecosystem. So that means workforce development, education, potentially also you know, research and prototyping infrastructure, getting to this kind of early stages of research translation. Um, and we're also building out these new translation pathways, really thinking about how can we move more of those promising ideas from the lab into the commercial sector or um, into society through open source, um, and really creating more opportunities um, for researchers to, to pursue these pathways. Some of the ways we're doing this is we're building capacity at universities to support this type of translation. So, um, you know, creating the constructs at university and the support network so that they can help their researchers move their technologies to the market. We're also supporting the development of open source ecosystems, supporting the organizations who develop open source projects and then critically maintain them. Um, we also have this really interesting 
uh, pilot with Noble Reach Emerge that's pairing biotech researchers with entrepreneurs and residents to come and help them and build this commercial plan for how they can commercialize their technology. Um, and these new programs, they actually all build on the long history of the translational research at NSF. Um, it, it, most people don't know, but um, NSF is actually, um, in 1977, was the agency that piloted the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, piloted it for the whole government. Um, and now, you know, more than a dozen agencies um, uh, take advantage of that program to fund uh, research at startups. Similarly, we uh, piloted the Innovation Core program, which takes um, small teams of researchers and really puts them through a boot camp in terms of how do they do customer discovery? How do they you know, tweak their product so it actually meets a, a need that then would, would bring in investment from, from the outside? And this program is now um, supported through other agencies as well. I actually was just um, meeting with some VCs the other day, and one of them who invests in really early stage biotech companies says he goes to i graduates because he knows that they have those kind of baseline skills that he has confidence in that you know if he believes in their tech, they have those skills, he can work with that. So that was a really neat um, a review. And then finally, we work uh, really hard to strengthen workforce development. And really it's all about kind of making STEM careers more accessible um, and attractive uh, to more Americans. Um, and so some examples of where we've done this, we've partnered with Micron and Intel to make a specific investment in semiconductor design and manufacturing workforce, acknowledging that as we make these investments to build our domestic manufacturing capability, we're gonna need a technical workforce to staff those fabs and to keep pushing forward on the design elements. So we're trying to get ahead of that demand signal by, by making this investment with our industry partners. Uh, we also just launched a new program around experiential learning, and it's about pairing um, either, you know, you can be early stage or you can be looking to make a pivot in your career with an opportunity um, in, a pri in the private sector or in government to kind of um, exper experience what it would like be like to, to work in that STEM role. Um, and let me pause there. We can talk more about some of the other partnerships. Let me great. Thanks so much. That's great. Uh, so, so, Dan, you're, you're definitely the, the weird person on stage here uh, and that you think differently because you have a career in the venture capital career. Uh, uh, domain. Uh, so if you could explain to us, okay, how do they think? How does that align with what you're hearing uh, here today? And remember, we're, we're government folks, so you're going to have to I'll, I'll, I'll try, talk at a level that I can understand. Right, right. <laughs> We've been going through that on a paper. We've been working with Dwayne, and it was like, I started talking about things like Hager. And Dwayne looked at me with this kind of blank look and goes, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I come out of the, I'm, I'm the weird person on the table. I come out of the venture capital world. I've been working in the area probably about 15, 20 years now. I'm, I've got well over 50 uh, cybersecurity companies I've funded, and I think I'm up to 13 of them in the healthcare space. I have to tell you, I make a lot more money out of, health, out of cyber than I do out of healthcare. It just takes too long. Um, so I think what's important in our part of the dialogue is that currently we're living in the past. And, and I look at, from an investor world, if an investor has made money or investor is making investments now, he's not looking for a return this year. He's looking for five years down the road. So everything that you start hearing about today through about 2028 is considered past. We're living in the past. When we start looking at the window from 2028 to 2020, 2035, we start thinking about, oh, that's the present. Because if I start making investments in the 2028 timeframe, okay, I'm gonna start seeing return on my investments in the 2035 timeframe. So when I start to look at how do companies evolve and how do you put investment in as it relates to technology, one of the things that we get excited about within my strange world is to take a look at the compound annual growth rates. Sounds simple, doesn't it? And, and if there is actual CAGRs out there that usually indicates that a market is already there and a market is already evolving. That also means that there's technology and solutions that are starting to be incubated in that market space. When we start thinking about 2035, and I find that as a fascinating point of reference, we start to see that the major programs you saw up there that, that they defined as markets are starting to hit what we refer to as the stable mature point within a CAGR. That's between nine and 12% annual growth rate. When we get to 9 to 12%, that indicates we've gone through a hump, 
Now we're starting to level out and the market's growing at a nice sustained operating rate. 2035 for things like healthcare, for things like supply chain, when you go through this group of, tech, of markets, they're starting to hit a standard lane. But what we really wanna take a look at is where does the intersection happen with the technology that actually intercepts that CAGR growth? Because you will see typically technology will all of a sudden hockey puck. Interestingly enough, if you look at the CAGR data on the major, major environments, the CAGRs hit nine to 12 percent on almost every one of those major market industries in 2033 to 2035. And we see massive hockey sticks in the 2035 under AI, blockchain, uh, the next generation of 7G as we start to see it come in. We see quantum hitting in those particular windows. That starts to tell us that we're going to see a massive cultural shift, but it also means that people are going to be making major investments in the 2026 to 2028 time frame to get stability. Now, I just throw a whole lot of financial stuff at you. The reality is you have to start thinking that says, if we know in general that major technology takes 45 to 50 years from concept to general availability, and we start thinking about where these things are gonna to come together, we need to start thinking today about stuff that's going to be available in the 2050 timeframe. God, isn't that scary? But from an investment standpoint, we're starting to see major investors doing investments in deep tech, things that are way outside the things we've been thinking about. Now, having said all this, the big thing that we like to think about are what are the problems? Because if we can make sure and we can understand the problem, we can start to apply evolving technology to accelerate the solution. Why I bring this up, and as Dwayne has pointed out, one of the things we want to talk about is how do we increase competitivity, and the competitiveness of the U.S. infrastructure. To do that, we have to think about how do we get problems exposed to the early stage innovators earlier than they get today. Because if they can start to see it, they can start to apply things to it. Things like public-private partnerships are a really good approach to doing that at this stage as we live in our past moving to our, to our present. We need to start thinking about that. That's what I get to do. I, I work for Barry Costa over here in the technology transfer group. Barry's here on the end. When we start to think about how do we bring technology into the marketplace, we have to think about how does it intersect? How do we see the big markets coming together and how do we see the big companies engaging? Are we thinking about tax breaks? Are we thinking about how do we engage the accelerator community? That's what I live in on almost a day-to-day -day basis. So again, I'm the odd man out. I'm not the developer, I'm not the policy guy. I'm the guy that just starts thinking about how do we take advantage of evolving technology get it into the marketplace at the right insertion to be able to change the competitiveness and the return on the investment. That's kind of a long-winded answer. Hopefully, I didn't lose you no, all in that great. dialogue. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to stick with you, Dan, and ask you to put on a different hat now. Uh, okay. In the last administration, you and I uh, worked with the Office of Management and Budget on a concept that they called the Gear Center. It's kind of close, uh, so that was really more about effective government management, but it was also about leveraging external non-governmental entities to solve that. So what did we learn from that effort that could be applied to this problem? That, that's an incredibly good question. For those of you who are not familiar with, about 2019 roughly, the PMA came out, Presidential Management Agenda came out and said we need to establish a thing called the Government Effectiveness Advanced Research Center. That got passed to OMB and OMB got the 10 transaction and MITRE got the ask to figure out what this thing is. We learned a lot of things from that because one of the things we found was how do we find problems in the federal government that don't have solutions yet, and how do we energize the academic community and the entrepreneurial community and then bring corporations into the game at the right time that they can start to infuse technology into their product sets. The Gear Center was a great project because we looked at nonprofits, we looked at the academic community, we looked at the venture capital community, we talked to the federal government, and the federal government got really excited about this, but of course we had COVID. One of the things that we have done since then, um, and it's been a fun project, is to talk to OMB and federal agencies and get their big problems, things that are sitting into the learning agenda. 
and then getting those issues into the large accelerators. People like Techstars, the people like The Wave, the people like Mass Challenge, and we actually propose ideas to them. They surface it to the cohort, which was something we learned within the Gear Center work, and then the cohorts are now thinking about the problem, and we're now bringing the government agency groups in to take a look at these early stage companies that are using next generation technology to solve real world problems. And, and that's, that's what we learned out of the Gear Center, and it was a phenomenal experience, and hopefully we'll get to bring it back at some point in time, because it really does take the problems of the federal government, applies it to emerging technology, early exposure to the startup community, and gets the investment minds thinking about how they can make money in five to seven years by getting a market, which was the federal government, that was the first customer, keeping in mind, there are only two things that startups want. There are only two things. First is, I gotta get money. Yeah, we gotta get money. But secondly, they gotta do customer acquisition. If they cannot get customers, they cannot raise money. And if you can't find a mechanism for them to get customers, you're in trouble. Gear Center was a mechanism by which we could create environments where early stage companies could get the federal government as a customer. And in getting the government as a customer, which means changing some of the ways we do procurement, all of a sudden they have a customer, they now can get in line for venture capital, and they have a market, we've got a ready-made market, we've got venture capital, and we've got the community now servicing the federal government. Does that kind of answer your question? I know that was a long-winded answer, but. Great, thank you. Uh, so PJ, when, uh, when we started this, I talked about three inflection points that we've already identified. Uh, there is a fourth that I didn't mention, but it's a huge one. Uh, so that's the upcoming presidential transition. Uh, so even if Biden wins re-election, that's just a massive change in the federal government. Uh, so how is what you're doing uh, aligned with supporting that? And what's going to be SESP's message to the transition teams and incoming president? Yeah, fantastic question. Thank you. For First of all, as a 501c3, we're like a foundation. So we're an apolitical organization that's learned to be bipartisan by growing out of the AI commission and how to get things done and how to move and help support both branches of government. So we, we maintain that posture as a 501c, is what can we do to help the United States government organize to help, help lead? So that's always our mindset. 24 is no different. And uh, so far, what we've done is we've released a series of strategy documents on America's competitiveness. So the first one, Mid-Decade Challenges to American Competitiveness last year, talked about the three futures that we think are on the line in this decade. And so the futures that we mentioned there are literally the future of geopolitics as we know it. This is the alignment changes you feel in the world, like China's unlimited friendship with Russia, China brokering deals between Saudi Arabia and Iran. This is a realignment and a changing. Which way is Europe leaning? Uh, in terms of economic and political partners. Second future on the line is the future of freedom itself. And the way we think about that is, is autocracy as we know it rising or declining, I ask? And reasonable people might disagree, but it doesn't seem like it's declining in the world. And so the ancient political debate between autocracy and democracy is not resolved completely in the world. And so that affects the future of freedom. And then the third future is the fact that there are these technologies that are maturing that subtend all the instruments of power. So tech power itself is being adjudicated in this decade, in this generation. So the future of geopolitics, freedom, and tech power itself, we think, are on the line. So we've said that initially in our report. What we've done uh, predominantly is to think about these very questions about how might we organize to win that decade and what does winning look like? And so in the same document, we supposed what losing might look like. And we supposed that China, for example, could have the world's leading economy um, in this time frame. We supposed that the United States military could lose a conflict in its most stressing scenarios, potentially like the defense of Taiwan. Uh, we, we supposed that authoritarianism as an argument could fill the vacuum in the world where China is making that argument. So, we went through what does losing look like, now we're turning to what does winning look like, and we hope that that's helpful for the 2024 year. Eventually, as we know, when the political campaign comes down to, say, March of 24, it's usually between two citizens at that point. And so, you know, 
in, in a completely apolitical way, whoever we can help think through that problem together and bring the private sector with us to help think through that problem, which is who we convene, um, we're, we hope to be helpful in, in that period of time. We just produced a special edition on generative AI. You might think of this almost as a two-year sort of update uh, to the AI Commission's work specifically triggered by GPT-4 and the whiplash that that has created. So we've thought through a document about where now is AI going and what might the nation do to lead through that. So we would hope that that would be helpful to anybody looking for recommendations in that space. And then as we turn into 2024, uh, we'll turn again to sort of bringing those thoughts across what we call the six battlegrounds and all of the recommendations that make America more competitive almost to an agenda uh, for 24. So that's what we're working towards. Uh, we have a summit this week, uh, the Emerging Tech, International Emerging Tech Summit. It's going to be uh, in DC. We're bringing together a lot of people to try to create, in essence, a collective process behind those recommendations uh, and to reach the world as well. So that's how we're sort of, uh, our documents are pointing towards 2024 and beyond. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Tess, you made the mistake of sitting next to me, so you get the, the hardball, a uh, little bit adjacent question. But as she's answering, we're going to have about 20 minutes or so for you all to ask questions as well. So as she's talking, please line up in, in the aisles to be able to ask your questions, because it's important for you all to, to, to be part of this as well. Now, I prefer that you all ask the next questions than, than me, uh, frankly. So uh, let, let's, let's let it have it. Uh, so the hardball question for you, uh, I've dealt with regional activities, state local activities, collaborating with federal government in a variety of contexts. And frankly, they're always quite difficult uh, because the regional activities tend to want to do their own thing. They don't really want to collaborate with each other. They see each other's competition sometimes. Uh, they don't always understand how what they're doing contributes to the national or international good. Uh, so how is NSF planning to integrate your regional activities you talked about into this bigger, broader s and problem? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, TIP was tasked to do things differently um, and to kind of take risks and chances with the way that we do R&D funding to, to really address some of these structural gaps that, that I think have emerged over the past couple of years in terms of the pace of technology development and also the pace of global competition. So, you know, as we look to the regional innovation engines, we are really focused on developing those, um, you know, those engines that will drive economic development in that region. And, and I think I might push back on you a little bit, Dwayne, that in a sense, I'm not sure they need to work together, but in aggregate, if we are successful in creating these regional hubs where you know, you're, you're advancing a technology, um, you're developing a commercial ecosystem around it, you have workforce development, you're creating jobs, in aggregate, that comes together for um, you know national economic growth and a strengthening of this this baseline um, of the U.S. position in emerging technologies. Of course, everything that NSF does, we try to connect where we can. Um, we have this focus on partnerships. So, you know, through all of our programs, we are um, we are making connections between performers where we see that that you know they their work could contribute to the other work. Um, so I expect that as we go down the program, we would do that as engines come up and they have overlapping aims, you know, bringing them together. But I think what, you know, for success in the regional innovations, I think that success really is on the regional scale. And then when that's brought together, that, that, that is knitted together for national strength. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes. You probably have to turn on the microphone as you pick it up. Thank you all for coming. Um, thinking about the 2050 timeframe, and thank you, Tess, for mentioning workforce development a couple of times. A lot of the workforce development stuff, right, when you look at the four topics we're going to talk about today and all of the you know, te key technology focus areas, at the K through 12 space, all rely on the same STEM education. But typically, you know, a lot of the focus on workforce development tends to be at the university level and not so much attention at the K through 12 space. And arguably, we've already lost the underrepresented groups by the time we're looking at, at college. And so, you know, I think, you know, TIP could play a, a, a very interesting role, right, in focusing in the K through 12 space to give us that pipeline as we start to see the divergence in the different STEM needs. And it, when thinking about the time frame here, you know, we're talking about people that are going to be in their mid-20s 
that need to be ready to go, right, to meet that 2050 timeline. And we do a really bad job retaining, you know, foreign nationals who come here for an education. So we're even losing those underrepresented groups to the United States. So how do we do a better job in the K through 12 space? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's so critical to us being able to compete in the future. Um, so the National Science Foundation writ large does a lot of work in the K through 12 space, particularly through our, our directorate that's the EDU, recently renamed EDU directorate. Um, and as it pertains to emerging technologies, take AI, for example, um, we have funded the development of curricula um, for K through 12 um, and, and doing training for teachers to be able to bring AI, not necessarily AI, but computational thinking into the classroom earlier and creating open resources that are available for teachers, training programs for teachers. And, you know, uh, I agree, um, you know, we need to pull that across a lot of our, our technology areas. There's a similar push in quantum, um, but I think we need to look kind of more holistically at that picture in terms of what are the resources we need to bring to the K through 12 space to make sure that we're, we're giving that foundational knowledge that when students then go on to higher education, they have that baseline and they're able uh, to then pursue more advanced degrees. Another focus area that we have across the foundation, specifically in TIP as well, is on those community colleges. So where can we catch some of those students that maybe didn't, you know, get that foundational knowledge in K through 12 and maybe, you know, didn't succeed that, that um, um, at schooling in earlier stages and provide them those opportunities for um, building technical skills, um, you know, later on or doing reskilling if they want to change careers. And so we're looking across that whole pipeline as we think through workforce development. So K through 12 is, is, a, is critical as our community colleges supporting advanced degrees and then supporting some of that reskilling. And what we, we talk about it as K through gray and really looking at that full workforce um, a support that's needed um, to get us to where we need to be. If I could just piggyback on that to say, I was a STEM kid, and I still am, really? sort of. Um, <laughs> and literally at the National Science Foundation, I attended the senior year where they took two kids from each state, and Dr. Susan Solomon, who had done the original research on the ozone hole, came out of Antarctica directly to our camp before she went to NOAA headquarters. And she said, I think there's a hole in the ozone layer. Now, we didn't have cell phones or anything there to Google, like ozone layer, we're at the age 18, like, I had meteorology, but I was struggling to see like what she was talking about. So for an hour of our life, we heard her tell us there was a global and a national problem. We were all in. So I'd suggest that K through 12 STEM could be greatly enhanced by just having national challenges hit the kids' awareness, right? So we have a number of these. In fact, all the national plans for US leadership that we develop out of the project with private partnership open with actual specific technology bogeys, specific, not vague about what ought the nation do to compete in the space. One, for example, in biotech is called MedShield. MedShield's starting to get some traction, but I'm not sure that it's known at the K through 12 level that you might be able to collaborate the basic scientific research to create something like an integrated missile defense shield for Pathogen Plus. But if they did, I suppose many people would be drawn to it. So it's just an, a phenomena. I think we can, it's free. Like setting moonshots and technological ambitions by itself, up front, doesn't cost anything until you do it. Um, but, but I mean, just the idea of it and moving the nation that way, I think is a way we can stimulate K through 12 STEM. And I think your point is well taken. I sit on the board for the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, CCI from the state of Virginia. And one of the things that going down this particular line, how do we, how do we deal and how do we bring those early high school, junior high kids into the game early? Because they've got great thoughts. They have incredible thoughts, but they don't know how to apply them. So one of the things we've been doing with CCI is to start to get more of our cyber thinking out through the, through the high schools, through the community colleges, and then extending the college programs to be able to touch that generation. Because you were right in your comment, kids that are being born today, okay, are gonna be living with the technology that's just now coming into existence. And when they hit full stride 21 years from now, interestingly enough, we're starting to talk about 20, 50 time frame, um, they'll be ready for it. But we have to start more critical thinking. One of the things we're missing in general is we don't think about solving a problem. We don't know, we don't know how to identify the problem and how to communicate it. Once they can think about it and they have an idea of things that they may be able to apply, it's amazing what they come up with. So it's, it's truly a communication and getting data out. And 
Sorry, I'm just getting that water. <laughs> Thank you. Sir, agreed. There it is. Hey, all good. Uh, back in the 1990s, we recognized similar problems that we still have today that aren't solved, and that is the education of our workforce and uh, developing folks that had the skills and talents to move our technology forward. We worked with um, North Dakota State University, uh, University of Alaska in Fairbanks, set up a nanotechnology center that was up there, similar microelectronics uh, organization at University in, uh, of North Dakota. And as we were working with them, the folks at North Dakota said, we got a real problem. And our problem is, is that we graduate all these fine young engineers to go out into the workforce. He goes, John, they walk out, they climb on a plane, and they fly off. And we're not retaining any of them. And so how do we retain them, and how do we go ahead and move it from uh, Silicon Valley or tech centers out, out to the distributed area for young people in, in other places as well? Really good question, and, and I'll try to keep my answer short. We saw this a lot. I, I stood up the Mach 37 Cyber Accelerator back in 2013. And at the time, we looked at Northern Virginia as, man, that's the cybersecurity center of the world. Man, we should see a whole lot of stuff happening here. And we looked at Virginia Tech, and we looked out at our universities, and we saw really, really great program managers and software people graduating, and they're gone. We asked the question, why? And they go, there are no jobs for software developers in the Washington, Northern Virginia area. All policy and services. Wow. Okay. We started working with the venture capital people, and we started to think about, in 2015, 2016, how do we create businesses here that are sustainable product companies? Now, we're really lucky that Microsoft is building a lot of stuff here. We're lucky that Amazon has moved out here. We've got all the stuff that's going on with Google in this area in high tech. And guess what? All of a sudden, we're attracting lots and lots of new generation people. The question is, how do you instill technology or, or get people out where companies can be grown? We know, and, and this is just as a subset, when the tobacco industry had the tobacco thing, there was roughly $3 billion that was set aside for Northern Virginia and Virginia and West Virginia for companies to start up. And huge amounts of money were put out there and built incredible infrastructure. Some of the fastest telecommunication networks in the world exist between Norfolk and the big data centers that are sitting out here. Nobody would go out there. There were no jobs. We had people graduating, but no jobs. So we've been looking at how do you bring companies, how do you create financial incentives for companies to start that will attract the people. It's a really hard issue, but it's really, if you can't find ways to get businesses there, because we know a startup is really only good for a 50 mile radio, and that's the distance that they can support a customer by any given day, okay? They can't go 200 miles, they can't go 500 miles, they can't go globally, they don't have the money. So you have to think about how do you bring businesses and create business opportunities and disadvantage areas really hard. But infrastructure, communication, advanced networking, those things become incentivizing things to bring people out to keep them. And, and that doesn't solve your big problem. But until we get to a point where companies can become viable, they're not going to attract people to come to those jobs. Really hard issue. Really hard issue. And a lot of people are thinking about that because we know it's a really big issue. Yeah, and, and that's actually absolutely the motivation behind the regional innovation engines is how can we start to incubate these, um, you know, centers of technology growth and innovation and the workforce to set the conditions for the creation of jobs so that the folks who are coming out of the universities in that area or coming out of the, the research done by the engines have, have a path to stay. I'll also mention that in the Chips and Science legislation, Commerce also got a mandate for regional hubs. And the way that we're working very closely with commerce and the way that we're thinking about it is the engines do this kind of early stage development and the hubs come in and they create more of that lasting infrastructure and the jobs 
um, and the latter stages. And so we're kind of thinking through this in in this cycle of of regional investing in regions so that we can, you know, start with the technology and the workforce and then build in the infrastructure and uh, for, for more job growth so that we have those pathways for folks to stay in the areas that are not the, the known tech hubs. Thank you. Great. Monique? Great. Monique Mansour, the Mitre Corporation. Uh, great discussion. Thank you. Um, two questions triggered off of PJ, your remarks. One of the first things you said is China had a plan. And I know the AI Commission, a lot of the SCSP work is sort of to address that gap. It yes. was fundamental. Do you have a plan? Is it durable? Is it resourced? Is it? Are there metrics that are meaningful so we know we're moving toward our goals? So exactly. would, would love to hear you say a little bit more about that and how we do that. You already mentioned a little across administrations. Um, the other thing you said is MedShield, and arguably we already had one, COVID-19 vaccine. And, and part of what we, I think, learned through that experience of having this remarkable technology that was life-saving for so many was there was a significant resistance to a new technology even though it was life-saving potentially. So could you say more about, you know, that's the supply, we talked about the supply side and the education side of driving technology, but what we're seeing is a very rapid buildup of the resistance to technology. We saw it with the vaccine, we see it in, in biotechnology applied to food and ag. So I, I would love to hear more about how you're thinking about not just market forces, but the demand side when you have this growth of an anti-science sort of um, movement. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, on the planning process, I think we really learned this in the AI Commission about how hungry both branches of government are for someone to bring a plan, in essence, bottom up from the country in a way that's completely apolitical. And so that objectivity has its own force. I think the question is, where are there players that are completely apolitical and objective enough to do that? It's something I think we're experimenting with. And, and since we're not a think tank, we're a project, we're experimenting with that. The AI Commission recommended an action arm that would create intellectual continuity between administrations that could get tech strategy into the lifeblood of the National Security Council. So who has the national mission manager function to lead old activities in such a way that it's in the lifeblood of the NSC? That's something that the AI Commission proposed as a technology competitiveness council. The basic logic was at the end of World War II, 1947, we had a National Security Council. At the end of the Cold War, we had a National Economic Council by executive order that remains to this day, now called Intercon. And now it's probably time to think again about something like a technology competitiveness council. In, so it lives between administrations. Congress added an idea to that that would be the function of that called the Office of Global Competition Analysis. And that came through SISI. It, it did get authorized. It has its own legislative history. It's still moving. But the idea would be that would in some sense be the analytic arm and perhaps something like a TCC, perhaps in the office of the vice president, perhaps an OMB, could be the action arm. And then it leaves this third question where TESA's space is really vigorous, which is who routinely convenes the private sector for strat strategic purpose? And I don't mean like me as a director at the NSC calling someone at OpenAI and getting some advice. I mean systematic strategy method to convene the best minds in the country to come up with a plan. So that's the third part. We've suggested there could be something, maybe gears like, called the US Advanced Technology Forum, USATF. We sort of looked at the US Institute of Peace as an institution that's on the mall. It's large, it's reputable. Some might consider it apolitical. It does pr preserve some sort of intellectual continuity role for the United States in the sense that incoming administrations are briefed by the US Institute of Peace on what's going on in the world, which you would, you would suppose the TCC would be interested in. So I'm giving you three basic ideas of an action arm, an analytic arm, and a, and a convening strategy arm. And reasonable people could disagree about where those sit, but we're pretty convinced that we need those functions. Uh, so. And again, to what end? Not necessarily to the end of a report, but to the end of a national plan that could then convene both interagency and private sector to act as one uh, with these audacious technology goals. So that's the organization question. Um, on the question about MedShield, you know, the MedShield thesis is in essence to design out the need for warp speed. So right now, if something H5N1 something aerosolized, you know, if something like that happened again, we think we would need a warp speed again. 
So at once, MedShield is both, it has five technical areas, but it also has the, con the conception of moving biodefense, whether it's zoonotic or human origin, to something that looks a lot more like the integrated missile defense shield, or something that looks more like NC3, something that's much more 24-7. It doesn't sleep on weekends. Um, it's, it's highly machine-aided, something that has a great global genomic survey of threats. It has both rapid vaccines, but it also has rapid therapeutics. It has advanced modeling and simulation, like AlphaGo applied to these subjects, and then something that does rapid manufacturing. So that feels more like a shield. Um, I, to your question about the cultural phenomena of biodefense, I think that is always going to work out based on mores, folkways, and taboos. Um, there was also disinformation in the space that came from outside the United States. That was, that was some factor. Um, but I think that the, the most important thing is that government has the responsibility to defend its people. It's a national security issue. We need the capability and the 24-7 force to do that. How the citizens respond is with liberty. And that's how I'd answer that. Well, I think I'm going to hitch on your point for a moment. One of the things when we look historically, and I'm, I'm a historian by, I mean, <laughs> who knows why, but when I look at, we had the arms race, and, and we had a cultural environment that created around that, and it was amazing the technology that came out of that. We had the space race, and during the space race, we were able to get a large cultural baseline, to your particular point, that accelerated almost every major area, and it crossed the barrier, because everybody said, we need to win that. So as we start to think about our culture, what are we going to do, or is there something out there that is going to generate our thinking that's going to say it crosses everything from rural America to corporate America to someplace that everybody says, I have to get there. And I think STEM is a really great way to think about that. When I look at the work that's going on in Israel, I look at the work that's going on in Europe, I look at some of the work that's going on specifically in India these days, what have they done to mobilize their culture to go in and do the things they're doing? In the case of China, the big focus on we're going to be the number one economy in the world. Okay, what are they doing? Digital Silk Road, we're seeing the advances in technology, and we're seeing them change their tax models. Not that I'm saying China's the right place, but what did they do? Take a look at Israel. What Israel did to change its, its whole mentality in the cultural environment, changing tax codes, bringing people together, you know, we are, we're one country and we have to pull this stuff together. We look at some of these major events that are going on culturally and, and how are they re-energizing this technology model that we're starting to think about. And the United States has to be thinking about if, if we're going to be the number one competitive model in the world, how come everybody doesn't think about that? And, and what's the impact of that? And how can we apply technology, bring people together, and bring those ecosystems that will focus on solving those things. And I think about AI a lot, and, and many people kind of poo-poo this, but deep learning was first written up in 1943. We saw the first occurrence of the write-ups on AI in 1950 by Alan Turing. Six years later, a small group of people got together at Dartmouth College during the summer and thought about this thing called artificial intelligence. And we saw all this huge thing start to build, and by the 1980s, all of a sudden, the thing that we now think about as AI was being put in autonomous vehicles. Then it kind of went quiet. Investment went in, moved from fundamental operational research to applied research, new people came up with ideas, and guess what? Two billion dollar acquisitions in the last year. So when we look at how long it takes this technology to evolve, how do we get people thinking about the problems that we're trying to solve. And how do we bring national will together? And I think that's kind of the underlying point, is what is national will? It's not something that happens in 2024, it's something that starts to give us an image that we're thinking about to that 2050 time frame. How do we do that? Right. Anyway, I'll stop. There's been a, an outstanding conversation. I have uh, one Volkoff question uh, that uh, each of you all can answer. I'll start with you, Tess, and just kind of go down the line. But as you look out into this audience, uh, we got about a quarter of the people here are federal employees. Uh, about half of them are from the private sector or academia. And then the other quarter are FFRDCs, predominantly uh, MITRE. Uh, so from each of your perspectives, what do you think you all need from them to be successful? And how can they, in return, participate in what you're trying to do? Yeah. Well, I think from TIP's perspective, obviously, partnerships is in our name. And, and I think... 
You know, partnerships are critical to making sure that the U.S. stays competitive in these key technologies. I think both the challenge space and the opportunity space in these technologies is so vast that, you know, one sector is not going to be able to do it by themselves. So industry is not going to do it by themselves. Government's not going to do it by themselves. Civil society. Um, and we need to find ways to partner and think innovatively about the way that we partner to, to address kind of our shared goals. And so that's something that TIP has really been working on. Um, in April of this year, we held our first, uh, NSF's first industry partnership summit to think about, you know, beyond this traditional way of partnering at NSF, which is, you know, bring together a, a foundation and a private sector partner and create a funding opportunity and, and make some grants to academia. Can we think about different ways of, of partnering that kind of meet our shared aims and can we co-create some of these concepts together? Um, and, and I think, you know, some of our, our uh, the key points that, that have emerged from those dialogues are around um, lots of shared goals in the workforce space. You know, we see it through that lens of U.S. competitiveness uh, and industry sees it in terms of we need talent now uh, to start to grow into these spaces and government needs the talent too. And so there, there are a lot of opportunities to partner together on workforce. Also on data sharing, a lot of times industry has the data that can really drive um, uh, research and discovery um, in the research space. I was just at this um, event focused on the AI institutes that we ha held on the Hill, talking to one of the institutes that's focused on optimization. And they've partnered with a regional um, electricity company to create a digital twin of their whole system so that they can run AI-driven optimization models and show how they're so much more effective in terms of managing the load, incorporating in renewables than the traditional models. And that makes it much more translation ready. And so I think we all need to be coming together to identify where are these opportunities in the workforce space and other spaces that we can, we can come together uh, and move forward more rapidly. Thanks. Really cool, Tess. You know, I'd, I'd say three things for all of us. First of all, every single person here and anybody who's online is a part of the US innovation ecosystem. And it's ultimately a system versus system competition. And it's why we think it can't be left to chance now because the stakes are increasing and there's a long history about how great power competitions play out and they don't all play out grades. And so it's better to have a position of strength as we go into these areas. The US innovation ecosystem is the position of strength. Um, and so ultimately, every single thing you're doing, number one, uh, to advance U.S. innovation, the things you touch every day, the programs you work, uh, the people that you're trying to connect throughout the private ecosystem and with government at NSF. That is job one for all of us, and we're all in that together. Um, so it's a system versus system competition. Your role in that system is, could be decisive, and that's the, that's the first thing I, I would throw out. The second thing is, I think all of us have, in some sense, an additional duty to connect dots in our ecosystem. So you might think of this as connectivating, right? It's, it's, I was doing it this morning. There's this, this large billion dollar challenge that's coming out of a foundation. And I thought of the two deep tech investors that have a bunch of game in the space to really move biotech forward in the country. And so they don't know each other. And so I felt an additional duty to connect them. I'm sure at everyone's sphere of influence, you have a great ability. I mean, both of you are like doing that in some sense full time, but I think everybody together, we have an additional duty to connect the dots in our ecosystem. The last thing I'd say is almost transcending tech is that as we enter into this future um, as a country and as friends of other countries in the world that are like-minded and moving towards freedom in the, in the world, we need to stick together. So in your sphere of influence, I mean, do not think for a second that China and Russia would not want to divide our country in some way if they could through information operations, um, through cyber influence in other ways. So to the degree that we stay united, like Manhattan, like Apollo, like Human Genome Project, like CHIPS, to the degree that we stick together is, is to the degree that perhaps we avoid Lincoln's foreboding warning that the United States could only be destroyed from within. So I think to the degree that all of us put the U in USA, that is an additional duty we also have, and so I'd add that as well. I'm, I'm going to underscore them, several points that were made. Well, you, you only got about a minute, Dan. Take oh, I'll make it quick, though. I got it. <laughs> Connecting the dots, absolutely, the number one thing that has to be done. We are not communicating the breadth and scope of what we're doing, whether it's conferences, whether it's meeting with universities, whether what's with communication and dots are important. Secondly, we have to think about very carefully what, what's the big problem area that's going to pull us all together. 
I tend to think it's going to be climate because the whole world is scared to death out of that. And we don't know what's going to happen, but I think you're going to see a huge amount of thinking going into that. Um, and I think raising the issues and having the discussions. Um, you know, as an investor at the end of the day, an investor is only interested in one thing, and that's making money. To be honest with you. Every major corporation is interested in one major thing, which is profit return to the shareholders. Okay. So we have to think about how is technology going to come to the market? How do we deal and help our early stage companies reduce risk to market? Reduce risk is something that I'd love to have a conversation about because corporations today cannot engage because the risk models do not allow them financially to play in that game. We have to think about that. It's an exciting time. I, you know, I, I wish I was 20 years old again, you know, as, as I'm pushing the edge of the umbrella now. But I'm having a heck of a good time. And, and thank you, Dwayne. It's been a, a fun time up here today. Yeah. Please join me and thank you, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so what we just talked about is what we're going to be transitioning into, which is a lot of collaboration and discussion amongst uh, all of you all. We'll be doing it in uh, terms of two, two tracks of four break breakout sessions here, as you see here. Uh, coming up next in this room will be uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and the other room will be biotechnology. Both of those will start in about 11 minutes. Uh, then we'll have another quick break to allow you to change rooms. Again, coming back into this room will be future, telecom future telecommunications. And upstairs will be microelectronics. So we have uh, some escorts for you. So Ty, EJ are going to be helping you get from one room to the other. Uh, so that's what's immediately next here. We're already starting to think beyond today. Uh, so part of the fun in developing the, the sessions you can hear about is the conversations that took place planning them. We have some fun in them and then the, the conversations that happened afterwards. But all of that leads to what we just talked about in this panel which is trying to get the government, industry, private sector, academia, working together on this big, big level problem. And as you heard from all three of our panelists, continued conversations, collaborations can be a big part of that. And so I'm very pleased to announce that uh, MITRE and AFCEA are gonna be working together starting in, in the spring in March. We're gonna have kind of this, but bigger, and annually. So there's lots of activities going on on each of these individual topic areas. But there's a big need to have conversations across the technology areas and at a macro holistic strategy level as well. Uh, so you can kind of start to, to go on and put that on your calendar. We're also interested in your feedback as well. Uh, so we're going to have two main tracks in this event. One is kind of that midterm track. You kind of see the topics we have here. Then we have the horizon things, which is what we're, we're focusing more on here today. Uh, Planning that event is going to be honestly very similar to how I've planned the federal government's identity conference for the last 15 years, which is we'll have public-private planning committees. And so think for each of these topics, I have about four people on the planning committee, roughly half of them in the government FF4DC space, other half of them in the private sector academic space. And for each of those reps, we really target someone that is a representative, not just themselves or their agencies, but of their community. Uh, so for all of these horizon technologies, for example, there's a National Science and Technology Council subcommittee focusing on each of those. We need to have at least one member of that subcommittee helping us plan those to ensure that we have the full government perspectives. On the private sector side, we don't want just uh, someone that's representing their company, but if they're part of an association and they can represent the interest of 100 companies, that's, that's kind of the sweet spot for what we're looking for. So you can see here we're asking for your input. Uh, very soon, as in the next week or two, we're going to finalize these as the topics and start planning those. So if you are looking at this and saying, oh, man, you're just wrong, you should focus on this instead, let us know that this week. Uh, but otherwise, uh, for each of those topics, if you hear something today or you didn't hear something today that you think is important for us to focus on in this event in March, by all means, let us know. And finally, if you or you have someone that you would recommend being part of that planning process to make sure that we're planning this event to be as productive as possible, let us know. And for all of that, you can send us an email at policy at minor.org. So we're looking forward to not just this afternoon, but to have continuing conversations to help drive the collaboration that's necessary for the nation to be a success going forward. And so with that, thank you for this opening session. I look forward to seeing you in our breakouts. Mm -hmm.